Hello scholars, welcome back, Mr. Hinkle here. And this is our first lecture kicking off the topic Earth Systems Through Time, and we are going to introduce the Earth System. So, what exactly is a system? Well, a system is composed of parts or pieces, and it's all these pieces that work together that comprise the whole, the whole being the system. So, good examples of a system would be the solar system. We got the sun, the planets, the asteroid belts. They're all moving in space, working together to comprise our singular solar system. Another good example I think of when I think about systems is the human body. The human body is a system. We've got the musculature, we've got veins, we've got blood, we've got organs, we've got skin, we've got uh, hormones, we've got uh, all kinds of things happening. And they work together to create the whole human body. Now, a system's approach is that level of detail. So often we study systems by their individual parts because the individual parts are easier to understand, but each part of the system does not work in isolation. In fact, it is influenced by the other systems. It is, uh, it interacts with those other systems. So we have this systems approach to the earth system that we apply, where we could say, Everything on Earth interacts with each other to create the Earth system. Well, that's really hard to fathom, but it is also expansive because it opens us up to this idea that everything impacts each other. Now, we drill down in order to understand individual parts or subsystems, but then we zoom out and see how do all of these individual parts work together. So this is a whole approach to science, to earth science. It's an earth system science where we're looking at all the interactions of all the various uh, interacting parts. We can apply this to society. How does the government system work? How does the educational system work? How do relationships amongst individuals work. And so it's not in isolation. It's all going to Im have impacts on each other. So systems thinking is really a way of uh, getting a comprehensive understanding to how things work applied into the earth system. <clears throat> We're looking at the physical, chemical, geological, and biological parts of our earth. When we look at this image, it's pretty, it's beautiful. What do you see? Beauty, nature, yes. But we could also say, hey, I see clouds in the atmosphere. I see rocks forming mountains, water in the form of snow and a river. The mountains are covered with green, that's biology. So we have the earth system which connects all of the Earth's processes, and these processes are happening within subsystems, or we call them spheres. So let's take this idea. Okay, the Earth is a system. <clears throat> Meaning, it is a collection of interacting parts, a collection of interacting processes. And we apply this to the way geology, which has really evolved into more comprehensive earth science. So I have my degree in geology a Bachelor of Science in Geological Sciences from Santa Barbara. Last year that anybody could ever get one of those was 2007 when I got mine because they rebranded into Earth Science. 
because the Earth system science is more comprehensive. It's looking at all of the spheres, the subsystems, and the transfer from one system to another, where geology could kind of focus into just the rocks. If you think about Earth science, it's zooming out because the rocks are affected by the water, by air, and so in turn are water and air and life. Earth system uh, science is looking at cycles, feedbacks, for forcing mechanisms, storage sinks, and flows. And what is moving through these various reservoirs in these various ways? Energy and matter. Energy and matter are moving through all over everything that we have. And when we zoom out and we look at Earth system science, we can say, how do energy and matter move, recycle, flow, store in these various places on Earth in this complex, intricate web? In order to answer that question, which is a big question, how does energy flow on Earth? Where does energy flow on Earth? We want to break this down into Earth's spheres. Now, I've seen this many different ways. Earth's spheres, this is the common one where we've got the four. We've got life, the biosphere, water, the hydrosphere, air, the atmosphere, land or rocks, the geosphere. But we could zoom out a little bit more. We could be more inclusive with our thinking and our understanding, we could even bring in space, the exosphere, the portion of the hydrosphere that's frozen because frozen water on our planet has significant impacts. We'll call that the cryosphere. And then humans have significant impact and we call this the anthroposphere. We are so impactful that we're basically, and it might just be the vanity might be the hubris of humans to say, oh, we're so important, we're, we need to separate ourselves from the biosphere because we're that important, but also no other single species has had as large of an impact as humans have had on our planet ever, as far as we know. Space, the final frontier. So this is called the exosphere. This is outside of Earth. It's the solar system uh, that is part of our Milky Way galaxy. The universe is big. It's big. Check out my lecture on formation of the universe and supplemental videos. I go deep into it, deep into space. So the exosphere is important because the primary source of energy for all life on Earth originates in the exosphere. And you guessed it, that is the sun. Solar radiation from the sun beams down upon Earth, heats up Earth. Earth releases heat into the uh, exosphere. So there's an exchange, it's called <coughs> Earth's energy budget, that helps to support and sustain life on Earth. Thank you, exosphere. We appreciate you. The geosphere, as a geologist, this has got to be my favorite, right? You're probably right, although I do really like the hydrosphere. I'm a big water person. Geosphere, this is rock, aka the lithosphere. So Earth's internal heat from the formation of Earth about four and a half billion years ago drives Plate tectonics, plate tectonics leads to the formation of mountains and oceans, the recycling of crustal material, the movement of uh, heat around the globe. So the geosphere is a sink for carbon, which means carbon dioxide gets locked in rocks and stays there for a long time, which helps to balance it in the atmosphere. And there we go, right? Now we're talking interactions already. But if we're specifically looking at the geosphere, we're thinking about plate tectonics and the raw earth materials that are made within the rock cycle. So 
the geosphere is the rocky part of our planet. The airy part is the atmosphere. It's a thin envelope that covers the entire Earth like, oh, missing you there. Atmosphere. Like the skin of our bodies. And atmosphere is wildly important. This is where weather happens. This is where climate occurs over long periods of time. It protects humans from harmful UV radiation. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap heat so that we have a regulated global climate. The atmosphere is wildly important for life to exist. Oh, look at that. There's another interaction. Earth systems science. All these pieces, these systems, these subsystems, these spheres interact together, but we pull out the parts so we can focus our studies on the atmosphere with the systems thinking that says, we're going to study this one part, but it doesn't occur in isolation. It occurs in a complex web of interactions with the other spheres, making up the whole of the Earth system. Let's keep going. The hydrosphere. So I do love the hydrosphere. I studied rivers in undergraduate and graduate school, and I worked in industry, chasing down big storms, jumping into the middle of the river, measuring the uh, magnitude and distribution of stream flow and sediment concentrations. Awesome. Rivers account for such a small, teeny, tiny portion of the total water on Earth. It's like 0.0007% of Earth's total water. Most of Earth's water is in the oceans, 96.5%. Another 1% in saltwater sources. Of that remaining 2.5%, most of it's in ice. A lot of Earth's fresh water, so 97.5% saltwater. 2.5% fresh water. Got a whole lecture on water, but I'll save it for here. Right now, I really just want to talk about the importance of water on our Earth. Water makes life possible. There we go again. Water can regulate heat because it has a high heat capacity. The oceans cover 71% of Earth and are really important for transporting the unequal distribution of heat around the globe. Hot at the equator, cold at the poles, but it doesn't boil at the equator, and the poles aren't absolutely sub-frigid, sub-zero all the time. That's because the oceans tra transport heat through the process of thermohaline circulation. Got to put that out there because it's a phenomenal concept, again, outside of our scope. In our scope, though, the cryosphere. So the cryosphere is just the frozen portion of the atmosphere. Ice. We're studying ice because ice is crucial for climate. Ice is crucial, right, there's the atmosphere. Ice is crucial for the thermohaline circulation. All of these things are wildly important for interacting throughout the Earth system, but we could say that ice is especially important because it exchanges heat and light between the various Earth systems. Biosphere. Bio, taking a biology class, bio means life. And so the biosphere is all life on Earth. Now, life needs resources, and the resources that life needs come from the Earth. And so it is intricately related into the Earth system. Life wouldn't be here without ice, water, air, rock, space, any of it. So light or biosphere is not possible. There's no life without Earth. There's no life without the systems and the processes of Earth supporting life to be here. And the very specific type of life that has a significant impact, a greater impact than any other species has ever had are humans. So there's this word that came about, I learned it when I was in college, um, anthropogenic, meaning human influenced. 
And so now it's being classified that the human part of the biosphere is the anthroposphere. And even deeper than that, some scientists would argue that we are in an entirely new geologic epoch, a new age of geology called the Anthropocene. It's a period of geologic time. If you look at geologic time by the events that mark them as distinct, we could look at the onset of human civilization as an event that has distinctly changed the structure and the shape of our Earth. Thus, we could be in the Anthropocene, but Anthroposphere is going to be the human aspect of our Earth system. <clears throat> so the Earth system, this is not the first time it's been recognized. The Gaia hypothesis looks at the Earth like one living being. Kind of like my skin is alive, my heart is alive. Oh, sorry if I dump in. My heart is alive, my bones are alive, but they all make up me because I'm alive. And so maybe all of these interacting processes and the exchange of matter and energy on Earth is because the Earth is alive. The Earth system is a set of complex interacting parts that do not work in isolation, but they all impact each other in a multitude of ways. And if we are to have a comprehensive understanding about how our Earth works, then truly we need to zoom out and see this beautiful marble in the sky for what it is for a complex system in space. Thank you so much. I'll see you again.